Um, I'm Omar Khan. I'm the chair of the Department of Architecture. I wanted to welcome you all to uh, this symposium and uh, later today a, uh, the keynote uh, is tied to this. Um, I wanted to first welcome our guests from out of town, Elizabeth Condon um, uh, Onink, who has just joined us, as well as Dr. Konjin Yu. Uh, as well as our discussants, who will be um, Millie Chen from the Department of Art, uh, our very own Lee Yin from the Department of Urban and Regional Planning, and Kristen Stapleton from uh, the Department of History. Uh, we're very pleased to be able to hold this. Uh, the key person who is missing here is Shannon Bassett. Professor Shannon Bassett organized this and unfortunately is unable to sort of uh, attend. Um, uh, Shannon uh, has been involved um, in, in not only organizing this, but has conducted a few studios as well as a study abroad program uh, in China, working on uh, a lot of the issues uh, that we'll probably cover today. Um, I also wanted to uh, thank the Confucius Institute, uh, thank you Bruce, who's sitting there, uh, for your support in pulling this thing together, um, as well as the Asian Studies program. Um, and, and then finally, uh, a very big thanks to Kristen Stapleton for filling in for Shannon Bassett as uh, she's away. Uh, Shannon has shared something with me to, uh, uh, to share with, with you, which was to highlight her students' work, which is outside in front uh, when you enter. There's uh, models as well as drawings up, uh, and so she just wanted me to sort of read this out. So. Uh, she said, featured here is the work of 12 UB architecture students, both graduate and undergraduate, who participated in the China Studies Abroad program run in the summer of 2015. They worked in collaboration with both the Peking University College of Architecture, Landscape Architecture, and Turnscape, the landscape firm of Dr. Kongjin Yu, dean at the Peking University College of Architecture and Landscape Architecture. Also on display is the work of uh, nine UB architecture and planning students who participated in the spring 2016 option studio designing village acupunctures. This was run at the uh, UB School of Architecture here, and they studied and proposed interventions for the same village, um, uh, which is uh, Zhijinang in the Anhui province in China. During the summer, studio students were based at the beginning and at the end of the program in Beijing at Peking University. In between, they moved on site into the village of Jinan in Anhui, uh, where they lived for three weeks. There, they conducted field surveying and made proposals for a series of interventions in this village situated in the Yellow Mountain region of southeastern China. The student proposals featured here offer robust solutions that promote concepts of social scaffolding and infrastructure, new programming, landscape recovery, and social and community building. So uh, uh, it's good to have Shannon's voice uh, also as part of this. And uh, let me pass this on to Kristen, who will take us further. Thank you. So uh, Shannon asked me to run through some PowerPoint slides, and I think some of the students, who, who are among the students went to Xixinan or took part in studying it afterward? Okay, so several students are here. Uh, after the panel presentations and, and our little co our comments from the three UB faculty, I hope that the students will join in and talk about their experience and how it reflects on some of the themes of the, she asked me to go through these slides, there's 60 of them. They're just now leaving Beijing. So we'll move through this pretty quickly and, and get to Anhui, and you can get a, get a little view of what Xixinan looks like, um, and then uh, we'll move to our, our two presenters. Uh, so actually, one of our presenters is there, Oning, uh, is uh, uh, met with the students. So some of you know him. Anhui is a, in kind of inland China, west of Shanghai. Uh, and the area that they went to is very near the Yellow Mountains, which are famous, uh, famous landscape, a lot of old architecture and new architecture. It's a good uh, landscape. So you'll hear more about some of the activities that were going are going on in the Xixinan village. I think from uh, uh, Professor Yu and also maybe from other presenters, the students certainly.
I'll leave this presentation on here. If anybody has any questions about any images, we'll refer it to the students afterwards. Uh, but we're going to begin now with a presentation by uh, Elizabeth Condon, who is an artist who has spent time in China and uh, is going to talk today a little bit about her art, her understanding of Chinese art and landscapes, and introduce the work of another artist. So Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. All right, um, just to give you an idea, after you pass your national high school exam in China and you want to go to art school, this is what you're up against. <laughs> um, this is from 2016. So Bi Rongrong went to art university in China. She is from uh, Ningbo and lives in Shanghai, and she and I met in Shanghai in 2014 um, when I was there for six months. So she has two MFA degrees, the first from Sichuan University in traditional Shan Shui mountain water painting, and the second at Frank Moore Institute at the Netherlands. Um, so I was interested in introducing her work to you because she shows a traditionally trained Chinese painter moving towards um, European culture. Um, this is an example of her Chinese painting. Um, and she felt, I have some quotes from her, she started out learning calligraphy from her grandfather, she grew up with him, and she always, was always just loved calligraphy and painting, and went on to university. Um, but she felt very trapped um, for two reasons in school, um, in, the, in the master's program. The first was that she didn't feel she could express her ideas, and the, she, that there wasn't enough of a platform for her to express her ideas. And the second was that the rules took over in the studio, that when you're painting from observation, you can be in direct experience, but once you're in the studio, for her, her mind would shunt to the rules of Chinese painting and she would become trapped in this. So she went to Holland where she studied with Kie Ellens, who is the director of an architectural house called Wall House, designed by John Hedjuk. Do you, do you know it? Wall House? So it's a house that has, so the, the, the bathrooms and sort of the living, the basic living areas, entries are considered history, the wall is considered the present, I don't have an image of it, I'm sorry about that, and then the, and then the living quarters are con considered the future, and Hedjuk built very few uh, structures in his life, so he's a very theoretical uh, architect, and um, worked on Cooper Union in New York. Anyway, this is all exciting background information for the work to follow. So this is from 2014. So when she went and studied with Kay Ellens, she, um, she realized that her drawings from observation were sufficient, that all she needed to do was to present them in a certain way, and that that transformation from, from the landscape, direct landscape observation to ink painting was already there. She didn't have to make a further transformation. For her, instead, the issue was displaced between drawing in the landscape and then how to present the drawings. So that took the place of ink painting. And she began with her studio at 25 meter, a 25 square meter space in 2011. After getting out of school, she covered the windows, uh, cut out plexiglass, and festooned the walls. Um, and this is called, um, hang on. I have a script, but I'm off it already. Um, so it's open studio. Um, and she says about it, I used my studio as a complete installation to build relationships between paintings and installation, colors and space, work and environment. In this piece, combining natural lights with the studio brought a new experience to my work that visually changed with the light. So this relationship between light and color and time passing becomes very important to her from her architectural exposure in graduate school in Holland. Um, the wall drawing from 2013, they come together as they fall apart, acrylic and watercolor on wall, so she goes straight to the source. This is in Shanghai at Bund 18 Temporary Art Space, and she's combining different moments into one as a process of describing a world in which they come together as they fall apart. So in working in the space, it becomes incumbent on her to, uh, to express the space, to work directly from the space, and that is kind of displacing, again, what ink painting used to do uh, with all of its rules. I mean, I don't assume you guys know ink painting, but there are a lot of rules, and I'll touch on a, on a couple of them in time. Um, 
This, she goes outside, this is also 2013, it's an installation at the Shanghai World Financial Center called Seven to Three Colors. So it's using these uh, plexiglass elements um, and she wanted to make uh, elements, again, the transparency of the plexi would reflect the passing light uh, day and night. And she worked up in the courtyard in front of the building. Um, and then this is when we met in Shanghai. I saw this piece. This is a sketch in ink of um, image from a forest. And um, this is what she did with it by painting it directly on the walls and windows of a gallery on the Bund. Um, and it's called, in Chinese, the translation is the grayness of the time. So she took pictures in a forest and traced the image directly on the windows in front of the Bund. And she used a pure, almost fluorescent green that subtly changes to different grays with time. So in the day, the window shades are stronger than the walls. And at night, the walls become stronger. So this, this, tota this totality of environment, it's as if a traditional scroll would become dimensional or architectural. That's kind of the, what's informing her work. Um, right after this, she went to Manchester, UK for um, three months. And there, this is her studio there. And she found that the poster walls from the neighborhood are the collages of our day and time. Over the years, different artists pasted posters or painted artworks on the wall. Then those are torn down and pasted or pasted over again, like the conscious and unconscious processes of drawings. So this gave her an idea about, well, she, uh, this is another installation when she got back to China. It gave her an idea about the way light moves. How does the direction of light move? So in this work, the direction is moving. The direction of light is moving. She um, takes pieces from the Shanghai World Financial Center installation and puts them in this space and then creates a mural painting of the way the light is falling and then invites attendees of the opening to finish. So she asks them, um, how do you understand the direction of light? How do you represent the direction on a two-dimensional paper? Will it be a line, a circle, an open, um, an open shape, a closed shape, or a shape without shape? Please draw a direction of light. So they did, and then she took away her mural, and that is the installation. So the work informs and, and repopulates itself as it develops. And again, here are, the, um, here are some of the images from um, England, um, and she's relocating them in a Thousand Plateaus gallery. Try images, a drawing being produced. This is April 2015. Drawings inspired by images I collected on the streets of Manchester during the residency you already know about. Posters, prints, and graffiti filled the environment around me, and these images became a medium by which I read the city. So based on this, she recollages the images. And what's interesting, she starts using a, a projector, a, a, a projector so that she um, allows her her to forget what she sees. She, it makes it possible in projecting for her to enter a different state of studio-based production through which she can directly converse with the canvas. When the drawing begins to speak to the environment, the drawing pe being produced, which is the title, which will also be complete. Uh, drawing from nature is a process in which you become a part of nature. This, these are quotes. You experience the nature in places and talk with them in your own way. But in the studio you are separate, more isolated from that active and live experience. I enjoy being a part of the environment. Sometimes I don't use a, a, choose a white cube space, I choose a daily life space. My drawings are from reality, so I want to be back in reality. The process is one of looking for a new reality for my drawings. The process is very important. Um, this is Breath, um, one of the last two works I'll show. Um, Breath is, was made for um, the Cass Foundation in, um, in uh, West Sussex. And um, she, uh, these are fabrication images. And then um, this is the finished piece. For this, she takes the gardening principles, the 17th century gardening principles of borrowed scenery. And borrowed scenery is the principle of incorporating background landscape into the composition of a garden, found in traditional East Asian garden design. <laughs> so um, in this treatise, Yang Yue, um, 
there are four categories. Distant borrowing, like mountains and lakes from afar, adjacent borrowing, neighboring buildings and features, yang jie, right here, upward borrowing, engaging the clouds and stars, and fu jie, downward borrowing, rocks, ponds. So you could say it's a combination of the last two, where these pieces are painted on the bottom. So you're bringing sunlight down below, but then you're also reaching up towards the stars. And after completing this piece, she created a solo show in Shanghai um, called Absolute. Um, and this is, these are plans for it. Um, taken from a concept by Michael Pol Polanyi, who is a polymath with theoretical contributions to physical chemistry, economics, and philosophy. Uh, Polanyi's, there's a quote that she uses from him saying that um, he, um, that personal knowledge is the opposite of objective knowledge. And so she uses this exhibition to create a personal knowledge based on the artifacts and shards of experience from her, ex her residency in the UK two years previous and other urban structures. So this is an oil on canvas painting 190 centimeters uh, square. And um, in modern society, the city streets are the chantre of the industrial area. Uh, so the paintings are just becoming more and more abstract and shard like creating a space, uh, creating a city for now, um, ingesting these as her personal knowledge. Uh, landscape impacts relationships between people, nature, and society, and they are rich with the energy of communal production. So the graffiti posters, advertisements, and architectural structures and patterns pass through the artist's eyes and become a form of power that prompts her to unconsciously record their forms. Another big painting. Uh, also talking about scale, the only thing that can be distinguished are tiny particles that extend into a boundless drift, as when faced with the limitless ocean of the cosmos and infinite worlds therein, we are able to grasp only the smallest piece of the world around us. So I think this has exciting implications for landscape in terms of how we're thinking about it and seeing it and experiencing it in movement as figments and fragments. Um, and so she goes on. Uh, to create uh, not only paintings, but watercolor, silkscreen, print, and collages on paper, of which these are some. Also linoleum cut, and sometimes plastic elements, such as here. So all the way from Chinese ink painting to this. through um, Western architect, through American architect, John Hedva. And these are two paintings. Uh, in 2014, I saw two paintings by her, very small, that were kind of interiors of rooms, almost clumsy looking. And here, they're, they're uh, so light and delicate and create such dynamic spaces, this interesting fusion of influence. So I was very interested in her work in Shanghai and really excited about her and consider her a friend. Um, and then, I want to contrast her work with my own because I was an untrained ink painter who went to China and became very interested in Chinese painting composition and some of those rules that constrained be wrong wrong. So I grew up in LA and this is an image from the 50s, the Brown Derby restaurant. So like LA, it's pretty typical to run into restaurants shaped like hats or cars shaped like shoes, especially in the 1960s. Kind of a culture like this, pop culture, the Flintstones for those of you who know the beautiful cartoon that ran for six years. And uh, in this cartoon, um, Fred Flintstone and his family, and Barney Rubble and his family, have narrative um, activities that move through space and time in a predictable linear sequence. But the background is always looping and playing the same background again. So you never get the sense that time is really running uh, in one way. It's always running in two ways, which is kind of like Chinese ink painting composition. Um, and then cartoon-like atmospheres like Shanghai, where I spent six months in 2014 where I actually encountered nature as completely artificial and reconstructed. And so that visually and aesthetically and structurally, what kind of implications does that have um, for painting, which is already that? Um, and the dimensional painting that B. Rong Rong is so interested in has kind of brought itself home in this kind of really exaggerated environment of Pudong, new business area across the Hongpu River from Pushi. And this is uh, 
This is during National Week, so it's pretty crowded on the Bund. Um, so um, my own experience with Chinese painting started um, in the early 2000s um, when I moved from New York to Florida to take a pe teaching position at the University of South Florida. And it was the first time in 15 years that I'd been in a landscape remotely resembling Los Angeles where I grew up and looking for a way to find a visual language for time and space that was filled with de deja vu and two different time frames. Like the Flintstones, I suppose, I found Chinese landscape with its assembly of marks of of text, you know, of textural marks that create space. This is Wang Meng, who many people feel has too much flavor for as a Chinese painter, but he's a Yuan Dynasty painter, one of the masters, um, debatable by some. Um, and then here is just a snippet of a really wonderful scroll by Huang Gang Wang, dwelling in the Fuchun Mountains. So a kind of reverie about wandering, wandering through the landscape, free from from the bureaucratic responsibilities of being a, a government official, which certainly by the end of the it, at the beginning of the Yuan Dynasty when the Mongols invaded, he certainly was free. Um, so this just on an aesthetic level and in terms of light and um, composition struck me as such a brilliant synthesis of, of overlapping times and also, you know, early version of film and cartoons and logos and just about everything. Um, so I adapted this into my own work um, and started traveling to China to look at scrolls and take Chinese painting lessons and so forth. And, so um, this might be an interpretation of New York. Um, I began, um, the stroke order is something that in the West is not really uh, a law like it is in ink painting, and stroke order keeps you awake when you're working. So you can't, it's always uh, move and counter move. Even a very mark itself moves away from you before it moves forward and vice versa, so you're always awake. You know, you can't just, it's not just mindless uh, exercise. Uh, it's, it's an exercise in consciousness, a, med a meditation, I suppose. Um, and uh, so these are some early forays into ink painting where I'm trying to fuse some of the texture strokes with my own. Um, and I'm just going to take you through some ink painting experiments from 2005, uh, 2014, in a, in a um, landscape that's like a Chinese landscape, literally built like one in, in Northern California. Um, and then um, in Shanghai itself. And in Shanghai, it, it, it was going to Shanghai, it had such romantic ideas about Chinese painting, you know, like getting away from it all and being in the landscape and being fresh and pure. But actually, and, and just the compositions, again, so dynamic. A pathway, for example, has to be broken three times. You can't have anything too obvious. Think the focus breaks and renews. There's always a sense of pause and refresh. And same too with empty and full space, one quarter to three quarters. Rules like that that may be wrong, wrong, chafe, but for me were really exciting because it was a, a kind of structure that was a total system, not just like painting a volume and then painting a space around it. But everything was contained within the whole of the composition. Um, and then so but when I got to Shanghai, I encountered what Chinese landscape actually is which is, at least in Shanghai, it was Pudong in Shanghai. And I started to realize the six properties of ink, wet and dry, saturate and dilute, uh, and bright and dark, uh, really could come together and when you gave uh, when you gave emphasis to the forms, you know, when it was, it's a rhythm, it's like music. So it's just the rhythm of making and producing. So these were some images I worked on in Shanghai, moving through the tropes of Chinese landscape that we all know so well, water and mountain and collaging and finding structures like two worlds facing each other or, you know, and, a, and, and an interpretation of the skyline that maybe uh, could move, move in a new direction with brush and ink past kind of the tradition of what it's, what it encompassed so far. Um, and then rolling back a bit uh, to 2009 in Beijing, where I was in um, Songzhuang village for uh, six weeks uh, doing a show in Beijing. And um, the sense of scale in China is so much greater than here. Um, so somebody can ride a bike with a 79 by 110 inch canvas on the back of it and just say, here you go. And you can just start treating it like watercolor. So the scale is really huge. And so um, pouring became like Puomo, splash ink painting. Pouring became a strategy to um, open up the composition, make it dynamic, and then pop. Details would be a way to close it. Um, uh, multiple points of view as you travel through space. What does that look like now? Um, and again, 
oh, we a small building like a scholar's house, using the tropes, but trying, but taking it somewhere else to an experience where all empty space is closed, all all emptiness is filled with color, so that um, the experience of um, global um, global travel if, or frequent travel is is really there because that's what it feels like to me over over saturation. Um, and then, um, but also a romantic love for um, ideas like the mountain is the is the is the pillar between the clouds and the water. Through the mountain, they become each other. You know, I love stuff like that. Um, so taking uh, something from Huang Gong Wang and pinstriping mountains and trying to make my own language from the tropes of Chinese painting. And again, splashes, uh, images put together. Um, so these are big paintings. Um, so instead of a scroll, if travel happens on a single surface, is that surface big? For me, yes. Um, so this is 84 by 90 inches. Uh, so now we're in Shanghai again, and um, I'll just take you through this arc of work, uh, which started out um, impressionistic and went into a more literal phase and then kind of synthesized those two and led to my current work now. So at first, I just didn't even know what to make of Pudong. So this is what I made of it, like 39 inches square, just, you know, pure sensation, pure color and glitter. Here's a more traditional Chinese landscape, um, making your way through water, rock, and moon. Um, and um, and then he, here, st um, working with um, working with different materials, ink and glitter and so forth, to find my way into a deeper space here called the interior of a flower. So kind of taking, just getting more and more artificial in response to the environment. Um, here's a traditional Chinese landscape of mountains in the summer, so hot. Um, so here. Uh, um, in, this is 79 by 98 inches. Um, there's um, a, a large lotus blossom type pour, or that's how I saw it, and then placing the city inside. And I just started to have this huge impulse to paint, really, like literally the city, because just trying to get control, I suppose, over that skyline in some way. Um, and um, so. I guess what I'm saying, 79 by 98, is just that um, the rules that 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 got me very excited sort of then then um, vanished before the actual landscape. Now and all those sort of romantic dreams about Chinese painting, and then just what is it? What is it now? And this is what it felt like to me. But one thing about Chinese painting that I do love is that it it's as much as a place feels like is what it looks like. So the sensory aspect is really important, and so that is what these paintings are to me. Um, Shanghai in the summer. It's a really dense glitter surface, but I wanted that skyline. I had to have it. And it was kind of like a, in, in Chinese characters, like a radical or something, something that would ground each painting in a, in literalism, but then also as a, as a, as a footprint to move out from. So this is the landscape again. So as I start to, as I start to get somewhere, I, 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 uh, I, lo I lose some of the details, some of the literalism. And I started to use Chinese ink in the paintings. Uh, it's not made for linen, but I, I'm working with it. So when I got back to the States, um, I presented the paintings um, in New York and designed a wallpaper made from my drawings of elements in Shanghai. Some of these drawings are quite literal, the stacked up bikes, the lanterns, etc., cetera. Um, and others are like uh, the planters on the bund being stacked with cardboard and things like that. So I made a toile wallpaper and presented the paintings on top of it so that uh, the experience of space could be layered um, in, in two ways, um, you know, both in the painting sensory and then more literal on the back and so forth. Um, and that got me to such issue of wallpaper, and this is, I swear to God, this is my mother's house. So I started to think, well, could I go back? Like, how did these wallpapers that I grew up with, um, how could these wallpapers um, create a kind of space as I drew them? So I started to trace them and project like B. Ron Ron was doing, not knowing that she was projecting. That's what's so, it's kind of weird. Um, but um, I started to project them to, to not attach to them with meaning, but just to be able to paint and to also investigate how 
what the wallpapers were doing in terms of pattern and harmonies in Chinese painting, because one thing about, I noticed in the Chinese landscapes that there's this emphasis on calm and, and, and rest, and that's something that I've, that in Western art is kind of, no, make it filled with tension, and that kind of, I wanted to explore that dichotomy. Um, so these are the last three paintings, uh, 59 inches square, so that's one five meters. Um, and um, so they're wallpaper paintings that I'm, just, I'm making two patterns come together. And sort of investigating wallpaper as a landscape, but also as a way in, in which how can pattern be harmonious, how can landscape, uh, what makes a landscape, what makes space, and can it come from a flat surface, and can, uh, can a combination of wallpapers or any kind of givens that are projected create a kind of topography in and of themselves? Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, uh, our, one of our commentators, Lily Chen, actually does a lot with wallpaper, too. And she very graciously allowed us, the Confucius Institute, to use uh, some of the images from her chinoiserie, her playing with chinoiserie wallpaper, which I thought was uh, very nice of her, because it was such an interesting. But before we hear from Billy and the other commentators, we're going to hear another presentation, uh, this one from uh, Mr. Oning, who is not a stranger to UB, because he's been here several times before, and always has very interesting things to say about contemporary China and Chinese history. So uh, let us welcome Uni. About a month, a month ago, uh, I was invited by Mili to uh, participate in a symposium at the art department of, uh, at UB. And I make a presentation uh, totally focused on my b sound projects. And this time, Christine asked me if I will make the same presentation. And uh, I, I decided to make different. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, read an essay I wrote in uh, 2014 uh, when I was uh, invited uh, for a um, researcher's residency program in uh, 45 years old anarchy community, Christina Freetown in Copenhagen. And I was, um, there's a, a group of young intellectual, Danish intellectual, and uh, they asked me to uh, talk about uh, the, the contemporary China. So I, <clears throat> I wrote this essay and, and talking about uh, the crisis China now have to face and how the rural reconstruction, the contemporary rural reconstruction movement uh, uh, what, they, what the what the what the, the contemporary rural con reconstruction movement uh, did, and how they contribute for the Chinese society today. So my topic will be um, crisis and reconstruction. When China joined the WTO in two thousand and one, it became a part of the global economic. The Chinese government has firmly embrace globalization, pushing the process of, of, of urbanization more radically forward. Urbanization is a kind of the distribution of the social resources, including land and property. It is in some sense more radical than a revolution. China's current land ownership system was established in 1949 when the community parties of China took power. Land in urban areas is owned by the state, while in rural areas, villages own the land collectively. When local government in rural areas need land, they change the land status, grabbing the land and selling it to the developers. In the process, many villages lose their farmland. And as a result, farmland across China is shrinking. According, the, according to uh, Lotus, China will become the world's largest importers of agricultural products 
in five to ten years. As China grows increasingly dependent on international change, its full situation is becoming dangerous. It is only a matter of time before a global food crisis occurs, and then it will be a huge challenge to fill China's population. Rural villages constitute more than 16% of China's population. During the latest half of the 20th century, villages exchanged, exchanged their agricultural products for support from the Soviet Union in the industrialization process, contributing their land and labor to urbanization and the new economy, but never sharing in, the, in its benefits. Since more young people have left the countryside for job in the city, China's villages are almost empty with only a few old people and children left behind. Fields like pharaohs and local government take control of the far land, giving little comp compensation to the village. Over the course of the past 30 years, there have been a great many protests concerning land issue, the biggest of which was the Wukang protest in 2011 and 2012. At the same time, former villagers who now work in urban factory are in danger of becoming uncertain workers should they lose their jobs in a global financial crisis. All of these fact factors place China in a very urgent political uh, situation. When we look at rural society in China today, we see, we see that its social structure was <clears throat> severely, severely uh, damaged by the People's Communist Movement from uh, 1958 to 1982 and that this damage has not yet been repaired. So uh, this photo uh, was uh, taken by uh, a souvenir uh, photographer, Mathieu. I, I invite him to visit uh, the Yi County for, for twice, and he, uh, and he uh, visits more than uh, seven villages in, in Yi County in Anhui province and interview more than 50 uh, uh, families in different villages. And then we can show from his photo, uh, this only old people who left home. The CPC's village committees replaced the cell rule system based on clan power and led by the rural gentry. But few villagers feel that the villagers committee really, really represent their interest. This is a, a typical crisis represent. This is a typical crisis of representative politics in China today. After the household responsibility system was adopted in. 1982, Chinese rural society became increasingly atomized and individualistic. At least leave the village and they have no interest in taking care of their parents. The wealth they accumulated does not feed back into their hometowns, but remains in, in the cities where their families are. Confucian values have <clears throat> evaporated, and, and the rural-urban relationship is becoming flawed. So this is where the new rural reconstruction movement comes in. Unlike the rural reconstruction movement in the Republican era, 
This is a photo uh, taken in 1933 with a lot of Chinese intellectual uh, who are working in the rural area. They have a conference in, in Zhouping County in uh, Shandong province. Uh, that is the, the base of Liang Shuming, uh, who running his uh, rural reconstruction movement projects. The new rural reconstruction movement has to contend with a rural situation <clears throat> set against the backdrop of the globalization and must grapple to a greater degree with issues of social and environmental justice. It has more intellectual resources at its uh, disposal but less government support. Most Chinese intellectuals involved with the NRRM are new left leftists sharing the same set of the anti-globalization and anti-organization ideals, which are radically different from the government's current policy. Some of their activity in rural areas are likely to be seen as sensitive by the government. So it is crucial for them to approach it as a construction rather than opposition. In order to create more space to operate within the political system, it is imperative that the NRM appear as a positive power in the government's eyes. Otherwise, it will, it will not be sustainable in a society so tightly controlled by the CPC. So this is the uh, there was the uh, two uh, figures um, uh, uh, leaders intellectual in in uh, rural reconstruction movement in the Republican era. One is Liang Shumin, the another one is Miss um, uh, Y C James Yang. So the new rural reconstruction movement was first shaped by Wen Tiejun, a researcher who coined the <coughs> phrase the three rural problems. That means rural people, rural society, and the rural agriculture. One now is now the dean of the School of Agricultural, Economic, and Rural Development at the Min University in Beijing. In 2003, he found the James Young's Rural Reconstruction Institute at Zai Chan Village in Hebei province and has sent many young intellectuals to the countryside to develop various programs and concepts such as community college, community support agriculture, which we also call CSA, ecological village, and the workers' home. Workers' home means the, the, some program um, targets the, the migrant workers living in city. <clears throat> so, in addition to one's movement, there has been other spontaneous projects such as one run by He Xuefeng in uh, Hubei province, Li Changping in uh, Henan province, and uh, Liao Xiaoyi in Sichuan province. Currently, there are more than 200 projects that fall under the Abrolas of the NRRM. These projects <clears throat> attune themselves to the peasants' need, giving them more education, trying to activate their subjectivity in the local economic and help them and helping them advocate for themselves. So far they have so significant uh, effect, effect. For a moment, I would like to uh, examine three current projects as case study for how the NRM was, especially regarding the new uh, collective economic and the, exper and the ex experiment of the uh, commons. An alternative 
to economic liberalism. The first project uh, I'm going to share is Siyan's uh, Siyan's uh, shirtless harvest uh, projects located in Ma Fang village in uh, suburban Beijing. It is a CSA farm with more than um, 170 uh, acres of land. Uh, the local farmers and the, the local farmers and the consumers from Beijing are the shareholders of the farm. The farmers get funding in advance from the consumers, and then the farmers can farm in the traditional organic way. Luis is distributed between farmers and consumers, and the consumers receive healthy food from the farm in return. The concept of the CSA is not original to China, but Shirley's Harvest Farm is the most successful CSA project in the country now. It has proved a successful tool for balancing the rural urban relationship. The second project uh, is the Hao Tang project, uh, located in Hao Tang village in Henan province. Uh, and led by Li Changping and Sun Jun, the co-founders of China's new rural planning and design institute. Uh, they set up their this organization in Hong Kong. So the CNRPD helps set up a financial co-op uh, in the village. Pooling funding from the villages, the villagers also can join in uh, with their land and investing it in the village, village's the tourism business. Perfect from the invest, uh, investment will be used to provide, provide care for the elderly uh, farm a kindergarten and school for children, and build a, com a common house for the villagers. Li Changping and, 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 and Sun Jun uh, provide professional planning and design service in an effort to make the villagers more like a village, but not an urban community. It does not rely on funding from the government or capital from outside companies is self-organized by the villagers with help uh, from uh, Li Changping and Sun Jun and is an innovative approach toward a collective economic based on the villagers itself. The third project is the Bisan project uh, located in Bisan village in Anhui province. Uh, and farmed by myself and uh, Zhuo Jing. We were um, yeah. primarily on historical preservation, cultural production, and public life in the village. We brought several old empty houses in the village, restored them, and settled down there to live. In the beginning, we launched a two years research project on local traditional handcraft inviting designer and artists to work with local craftsmen to create new products in the old way. In 2011 and 2012, we organized three major festivals in the village, inviting international and domestic artists, designers, architects, musicians, filmmakers, writers, and activists and activities to, to develop the activity with the villagers and publish book and magazine based on our research about the village. In 2014, we transformed an, <clears throat> an old clan hall into a bookstore. We call it Bisan Bookstore. The villagers own the buildings collectively. We do not have ownership of the property and the villagers do not charge rent from us. It has become a successful public space, both for villagers and 
for peoples from outside. To put the ideas of the commons into practice, whether Lawrence Lessig's Creative Commons or Michael Hart and Antonio Negri's Commonwealth, we need to go beyond the idea of property ownership. <clears throat> we need to we need to go beyond the idea of a property ownership uh, inherent in economic liberalism and find a new way of sharing. Three three thousand years ago, China developed a land ownership system called Jing Tian Zhi, <coughs> which means the well film system or nine square system. Uh, that means one larger square uh, piece of land was divided into nine small pieces. Uh, like the Chinese uh, collector uh, Jing, which means well, the, the eight other ones uh, allocated to peoples who have to cultivate the central uh, block as a common land. This is uh, similar to the notion of co-housing uh, in some in intentional community in Western country today. The Jing Tian Zhi was a kind of uh, practical utopian formed by our Chinese ancestors and has influenced generation of Chinese dreamers, including the prisoner uh, practitioner uh, in rural area. The new rural reconstruction movement has done some interesting experiments involving the idea of the commons, both in economic and cultural uh, sphere, seeking alternative methods for rural development, improving religious life, and making Chinese society more uh, resistant to the crisis as a whole. Thank you. We have uh, two presentations from very different perspectives uh, on uh, contemporary Chinese culture and art and uh, Chinese traditions and, and how they can be remade for the future. And we have three discussants all representing different disciplines at UB, and we're, we're gonna try to each of us uh, uh, give, give our thoughts on the two presentations and, and maybe other thoughts as well. But I thought since none of the three presenters, as, as far as I know, have images to show, that the, the five of us on the panel could all come up here and uh, we'll take turns with our comments and then uh, ask the audience to join in with their comments and questions. So if I could ask everybody to come on up here. Uh, after after uh, we're, we're, we're gonna kind of conclude in a, in a, let's see, about an hour, and then we'll have a little time, a little break, and I, and I think there'll be a little reception, uh, and then reconvene uh, at six o'clock for a keynote address by Professor Yu Hongjian, who's going to talk about his work and rural areas, and his, his uh, landscape architect is going to talk about uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, currents going around about Chinese landscape design and the resources available to actually uh, implement some of these visions. So I'm going to turn the lights on. Yeah, and then, uh, so after we, we, the three of us make our comments, then uh, our, our dean here is, uh, I mean, the, the chair of architecture, Omar Khan, who I guess will pass the microphone. So, Millie, would you like to start? Thank you both for your presentations. Um, this is fun to thread <laughs> between the two. But I think the main thing is, uh, that comes to my mind is, and, and based on the theme of the symposium, which is landscape, but, and the recovery process of landscape. So um, an immediate question is, what is la how, how is landscape defined in this moment? And then uh, what is the relationship between landscape and land? Because I think, Elizabeth, you talk much about landscape. And so the aestheticization process, and so then 
what is the function of aesthetics in terms of a recovery of landscape, and then owning, um, talking about land, but also touching on landscape and aesthetics, certainly. Um, and so that would be my first question, which, I mean, there are uh, many other points that you both raise that are um, very stimulating. So maybe as a secondary or as a substrata of that question, for instance, Elizabeth, um, you talked about very interestingly the two points, the two perspectives. Like one artist, uh, the Chinese artist uh, Bi Rong, breaking the rules, and then you coming in as an outsider, embracing the rules. So, um, what is that? Those approaches or that kind of relationship between um, different cultures, different and in, in the case of uh, things that Oning brought up, different political systems, um, how, do we, how do we represent or translate and, and work together, um, embracing the traditional, but you know, picking and choosing, and then, uh, so, yeah, I'll just, that's enough to start with. Thanks. Well, just very quickly, um, I think that being in another place really shows you where your own place, where you come from, your point of origin, you see it in such stark relief when you are immersed in another kind of situation. So I think that's commonplace, but it's profoundly true as well. Um, I think that be wrong wrong will never be able to break the rules fully, just like I'll never be able to understand them fully. Um, you know, because I'm not a Chinese painter, and um, and I really know that. Like, like I mean, there's just, I can't, just in terms of making, it's difficult to access the kind of knowledge that you would have if you knew calligraphy your whole life. So I can only pretend at it, and I know that. And I can't, you know, so I'm not sure this is the kind of answer, but this is what's coming to me now, and I think, you asked an interesting question about the relationship of landscape to land. And I think that in a way, uh, for me, painting is the land. You know, or the land is like, I mean, it's, 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 hor it's horrible to say in a way. It's a bit, uh, uh, what's the word? Well, colonialist is not the word I'm looking for, but it's the word that's coming to me. So it's going to have to do, but it's not exactly what I mean. Uh, but this um, idea that um, landscape is, I mean, landscape is movement now. It's nothing but movement, you know. It's not like there's a landscape. No matter where we are, it's always being re, uh, recombined, reconfigured, redefined um, on the map and so forth. And so um, I feel like it's, it's um, or think that it's movement and that in fact painting is a pause for it where it can exist. And I suspect, although I can't say for being wrong, be wrong wrong, that she might have some similar ideas about that, or that for her the installation would would provide that role of a kind of simulacrum that feels more real than the than the thing itself. Okay, the, the landscape in China actually is, uh, have a very radical change. I remember because I was born in the uh, part of the Delta area and grew up in that area. And it, I mean, during my childhood, the, the whole uh, Guangdong area is very, with, uh, with very beautiful nature. Um, and then at the beginning of uh, 1980, the central government decided to set up the Shenzhen uh, economic, as a special economic zone. And then the, the landscape of the part of the Delta totally changed. Uh, and at, at the first 10 years, the, all the, the farming land and, and became the, the factory. The factory, or, and, and then a lot of labor, uh, cheap laborers from uh, uh, different provinces and they moved to uh, Shenzhen, and, and they're working in the factory. And the, the farming land in, in Purva Delta 
uh, totally uh, shrinking. Uh, this kind of uh, uh, very radical uh, landscape change from a, a fiction village to a, 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 a rapid uh, developed, uh, developed uh, city. That it is uh, so, and, and then today, um, when when uh, <clears throat> when different city expand um, to the suburban and getting bigger and bigger, because the, the land resources is not enough to support the the, the depart development, then the, the the capital and the government start to grab the land from the the suburban and the, the countryside for urban development. So today, um, for example, in Anhui province, actually that the, 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 that, that is very famous historical area in, in China because the very beautiful Yellow Mountain, the uh, most famous tourism site, and also the beautiful Anhui style uh, vernacular architecture. But today, um, a lot of capital or, or maybe some now, even some uh, architect. I mean, today the, the rural reconstruction uh, now become a, a very trendy term. Um, everybody want to participate in, uh, especially some architect. They want to build. They want to real, realize their dreams in the countryside. They and, and then they build a lot of things in the countryside. But they. It is. I mean, uh, they bring a lot of new design architecture in the rural uh, society um, and so that is also a, a kind of power that changed the rural landscape uh, because some some uh, architect um, they they are now bring a lot of a new building for the for the countryside in the name of rural construction but actually uh, those new buildings have no connection with the traditional vernacular architecture tradition and and they also is not designed for the villagers. It's designed for those uh, middle class people who want to have a holi uh, holidays in in the countryside. So all this the landscape, the radical change of the landscape actually reflect the radical change of the reality. Uh, that is why I always uh, uh, <coughs> pay my attention to something behind the landscape. Um, yes, in terms of uh, landscape change, especially for rural development, I'd like to share some stories happened um, uh, for my hometown, which is uh, the capital city of Yunnan province. It's called Kunming. So uh, several years ago, the government decided to build this uh, satellite city of Kunming and move all of the government um, um, agencies and the universities there. Um, so they chose this uh, little town, it's called Chenggong. And it used to be um, a place where um, you know, it, it produced very nice flowers and fruits and also all of our vegetables basically are, are, were all from there. Um, I was lucky to hear some stories from um, sort of both sides, so from the villagers and also from um, people who are doing construction work. Because um, um, my classmates, a lot of them are in charge of building university campuses. And then we are also doing some re research work. We did some interviews with villagers. Um, so in terms of agricultural land loss, I asked um, you know, the um, university, like people who are in charge of the construction, I said, um, what do you think about that? How do you think about you know, all of this nice agricultural land is not going to be there anymore? And they were like, why is that a problem? Um, so when I asked the villagers, um, they told me, they said, what can I do? The government decided to do that. We basically have, don't have any choices, but we are compensated pretty well. So a lot of them actually said they are satisfied with the compensation they got. They got a few uh, apartments 
um, in, in the uh, multi-floor uh, uh, buildings. And um, they also got lots of um, cash, basically. Um, so they, for, let's, let's get back to the agricultural land loss. Um, I don't think, like, uh, in my hometown, there is um, any um, sy systematic, um, how do you put this? Like, nobody have a plan, really, a real plan on how do we protect the, the land or what do we do after the land loss. So do we have a plan? No. And um, we also did interviews according to the travel time change. Because after all of the universities moved there and the government moved there, people have to travel there. And we find that the travel time changed from about one hour, uh, from, from, sorry, from about, about 10 minutes every day, one way, to one hour every day. And we asked them, why do you want to do that? Why don't you just move there? And the answers we got um, are because they want the connection with their old friends who are still living in the city. They do not want to move to this um, town, this new South Lake City. They still have the social connection in the city. They do not want to stay there. And when we interviewed the businesses, in the villages close to the university campus or the government. Um, they said not many people actually um, went there, for example, restaurants or small shops. Um, they, they're, they're not very popular because um, if people really want to go use um, or, or go to a restaurant, they go back to the city. If they want to buy clothes, Again, they go back to city to buy clothes. So the, the businesses are not very successful either. Um, and um, in terms of the education, I'm glad to hear, like uh, they, um, in this example, only just presented, they talk about um, the kids' education and so on. Uh, but in this uh, particular example we looked at, um, they again they did not have a plan for kids um, in the villages so they are they were well compensated but they don't have a plan for their kids like whether they're getting good education or good training for example in the US there are lots of um, communities or organizations to help you uh, to train you to get jobs not, not there so they have they have no idea what to do with their cash lots of them um, they buy luxury products. That's, you know, that's what I saw from um, uh, our visits and, and interviews. So um, that's some observations that um, I, I have um, in terms of the rural development or suburbanization or um, urbanization. And uh, one more thing that I, I wanted to mention, I feel like with the rural development now, or the suburbanization going on now in, in China. We're moving towards the direction um, like we did in the US um, many decades ago. So people travel using vehicles instead of, instead of walking or biking. In this interview we did, I said the travel time changed from 10 minutes, which is basically bike or walk from one hour, which is by vehicle. So in the future, there is going to be problem on health also, and air pollution. All of the things that we are talking about nowadays, the walkability stuff, the traffic jam. So um, um, basically all of this are from the planning perspective. Well, one more comment, and then if the our main presenters uh, don't want to respond, we'll just open it up, right? So uh, I'm Kristen Stapleton in the history department, and um, I I work on issues. Actually, the name up there, owning site at Philip Kuhn, he was my advisor. 
Uh, so he drew on some of my advisor's work, and he, my advisor and I are both very interested in local government, issues of local government. And it's related to this topic because, as, as Lee just suggested, um, coming up with some kind of collective will is a challenge for every political system. And in China, it, it's a problem that's still ongoing and hasn't really been solved yet. And uh, so I think it's worth of us, us to think about it. How is collective will actually identified and then, you know, figured out? The, the China, the political system under Chairman Mao, the communist system, had this idea of the mass line, which is that the Chinese Communist Party members would go and become close to the people, and then they would learn what the people wanted. They would help also educate the people. It was a dialectical process as appropriate for Marxism. And then uh, that greater collective will would somehow be transferred into, transformed into policies that would improve everybody's life. And there were problems with that at many times in the history of the People's Republic of China. Uh, President, new President Xi Jinping, who's been in charge the last few years, has continued to talk about this, actually talked about it more than his predecessors, but it, it doesn't seem to be working well in practice. There aren't good models for a, a kind of a sensitive planning process that will take into views of the view all the stakeholders. Of course, that's a problem in our society as well. Nobody solved the problem. Uh, how is it going to be solved in China? Well, if you think about these landscapes, I, I think, you know, from a point of view of, of a, an analyst, a planning student, or an architectural student, uh, and you, you like the idea of drawing on Chinese tradition, uh, I think you have to look, step back and say, so how do these particular landscapes come to be? How do they come to be over time? Is it just a kind of gradual accretion of customs? Or do people actually choose to do this? It, is this a landscape that people want? And this also speaks to Lee's recent work in Quinning. Um, we like these kind of terraced hillsides and you know that show that you eke out and, and Bonnie El Foy Albers has beautiful pictures of, of this kind of landscape where people eke out a living, but has its time passed? Any of you who are in the historic preservation here, I know, I'm sure talk about this all the time. How do we decide that something is actually worth preserving? Who gets to decide? Um, is it just powerful people? Can we involve other people? How much attention we, do we pay to custom as opposed to what might help people in the future? Um, speaking of respect for custom, respect for the past, uh, in the Maoist era, uh, uh, the Chinese past was considered to be a, a drag on China, something that you have to overcome. And uh, so Chinese traditions were uh, disparaged. Confucianism was not taught. There are some people, some scholars in the West actually, who said that Confucianism died and it could not be restored because the whole culture that supported it of the civil service exams and people memorizing texts, that could never be recreated. Nowadays, there are people who are saying that's not the case. We actually can draw from Confucian ideas. We can draw from all of Chinese uh, wisdom of the past. We don't have to reinstate the civil service exams necessarily in the way that they existed in the Qing dynasty, for instance but we nevertheless can draw on ideas. And Onin gave us an example of that with the well field system. I'm glad uh, in his text he, had, and he said uh, in, his, in his speech that this is an idea that Confucians dreamt with because it never actually was probably actually implemented any time, this well field system. But it emphasizes that Confucianism has resources for dreaming. And it's something that not everybody realizes that, I mean, a lot of people think of Confucianism as a fairly rigid system of thought where, where you, pay it, you, know, you pay your respects to your parents and you, it's a discipline, it's a kind of, but actually there's a lot in Confucianism that's very utopian. And it's that strain, I think, that particularly appeals to Oning and, and, and some, uh, some other thinkers. But there's a war within the, the, the Confucian world about how to interpret it, certainly, because it's, it's as rich as any world you know, scholarly, philosophical, religious tradition. Uh, so more attention to how debates have occurred in the past among Confucians, I think, would also help shed light on some of these questions. So what if the collective, if we actually figure out a way to make decisions collectively, what if they make decisions that intellectuals don't like? This is a very practical question in the current election season. <laughs> uh, uh, and so we understand very emotionally what that means. If the collective rejects our vision, you know, what happens. That's something that, that should be thought about. And I particularly wanted to kind of end with this question of both of our speakers because, 
you know, they are artists. Oning has made films, and he's, he's a social activist as well. And the artists, it seems to me, and, and professors and intellectuals and architects seem to me to come out of a, tr a very individualistic tradition in many ways. They're kind of mostly working by themselves. They, their name is their brand. You know, their, their things sell because they're made by them. Uh, un unlike, say, the old architectural tradition in China, where craftsmen were fairly anonymous and, and you know, they built buildings according to models. So how can it be that intellectuals and artists can help create a sort of sense of collectivity? Um, I'd, be, I'd be interested to hear that, given that they are so much individuals and personalities, and that's a part of their appeal. Um, can they lead a collective if they are stars? It's kind of my question. So I don't know if they want to respond right now. We should just open it to the audience. What do you say? Open it up for. Okay, the vote is to open up for questions and comments, and uh, Professor Khan will uh, pass a microphone around, and I will too over on this side of the room. I'll start. <laughs> um, I think it's it's probably uh, 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 it's a bit of a cliche, probably, or a stereotyping to think of artists as. Uh, or creators as being isolated and um, individually, individualistically driven, because uh, in terms, I mean, what is the ultimate outcome? It's culture. It's culture. So cultural production is a collective, and I'm, I like this. I, I like this term, collective will, as opposed to collectivism. That um, it's maybe an unintentional will, but it's it's um, it, it is the it, it's, it's the dynamics of various individuals uh, coming together and there could be a lot of disagreement and competition, but that's all actually very healthy in the end. So I say it's all collective. Any comments or questions for our presenters? You don't have to respond to particular points that were made, but if you have any questions about just contemporary China. I have two questions. The first is, uh, to what extent does agricultural production play a role in the rural reconstruction efforts? Um, as Reuters would have it, it seems like a national security issue perhaps for China if it's going to become a net importer. Um, but maybe Reuters exaggerates, I don't know. Uh, uh, then the second question is, um, China, as everybody knows, long history, very large, diverse country. So when you look to rural traditions of land use, agricultural production, how do you know where to choose from? Unless maybe the diversity is exaggerated and there really is just one model historically. Um, so. Do you want to re respond to that? Okay, the, um, we can say that the modern China is uh, uh, based on the agricultural production. Um, all the, this empire was built in, uh, on the agricultural production. The, uh, I remember this, um, um, okay, uh, the, the Lui Huang has uh, the, the 15, how to say it? Eighty-seven, a year of no significance. Ray Wong. Uh, yeah, the the fifteen yin chun It's very complicated because uh, actually the, the location of the fifteen yin chun deng yuxian almost same as the Great War, and 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 the the, the eastern uh, <coughs> eastern south was uh, can uh, so agricultural. Agrarian society could be supported southeast of that line. Yeah, and 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 the west and north was. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 the uh, the 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 the
Um, and the, the rules of uh, society which designed by Confucian uh, actually have very good, uh, is a very good uh, system. Uh, um, because, okay, we, we, we have a piece of land, we need to uh, raise the, the production, the agricultural production, and then we need to get all our family members together to farming on this land. And then to, to, to live together, we, and then we have this uh, uh, vernacular architecture like too low. Yes, all the members live together and farming together, and then and then can raise uh, raise the uh, agricultural production from the land. And and at the same time, for the society, every village was uh, with the same family. They live together. Everyone, every individual, at the first, you need to take care of your parents take care of your family, and then you need to take care of your, your uh, country. Finally, you need to respond to take care of the, all the space under the heaven, Tian Xia. And, and also, the, the rural society in China actually is a super sta stable society because um, they, they have each village, they have this public uh, granary. The, the, every year when they produce food, they have extra food, they will uh, storage in the public uh, granary. And also they have this public land. Public land, it's not a uh, private uh, old, it's owned by all the village. And the production from the public land can um, will devote the, the income will devolve on the education for the children in, in the same family. So if some homeless people in this village, the, the, the public, uh, the public uh, granary or storage will, will, will get the food for the homeless people. So for the first generation of the overseas Chinese students, um, like Hu Shi, the first generation of overseas Chinese students, uh, they, they get the funding actually from the Qing uh, government. The Qing government, actually, the funding actually from the United States. Um, why they decide to go back to the China? Not because they like Qing uh, government or they like the Republican government, because when they was young, they were was a child, it is the public, if they are or often, they are it, it is the, the whole culture who, which raised them. So they need to uh, go back, to pay back for this culture. So they decide to go back to China. Uh, um, so the, the, the very uh, super uh, stable rural society was broken by the, the, the modernization, especially the individualism uh, from after the main four movement, uh, so, so, um, so the also the nobody nobody take care of their parents and 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 every they everybody have their small family. The the fund the money the the wealth they 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 make in the city never return back to their hometown. But in in Qing, in, but in Qing and Ming, Ming and Qing dynasty, the Huizhou, the Anhui businessmen, when they make money, they always will send money back to their hometown, and then the, their family in the hometown can have a lot of funding to build a beautiful house, to clean houses. Uh, that is a very good relationship between uh, rural and urban. But everything was broken after after the the so-called modern. Modernization. Um, that, that is, it's quite difficult to, to express deeper. I, I, there are some elements of that that I would disagree with, but it, it didn't really address Bruce's question, which I mean, I, I don't think it was just the, the cultural stress on individualism that, I mean, the 19th century was a terrible century for the Chinese, and the economy was already broken. People could not stay in their home villages. There was a huge amount of migration. The super stable village was not very stable in the 19th century. 
already before ideas of individualism. So I, I think there are a lot of reasons for the problems in the countryside. But as far as Bruce's question about the emphasis on agriculture in this new uh, village reconstruction effort, I mean, I think in the 1920s one that you were talking about, that was uh, thought of quite a bit. You know, how are we going to help farmers uh, deal with the, the terrible depression that there is? The silk market is declining. In the current one, I think I think Professor Yu will be talking a little bit about that. The importance of agriculture in contemporary China, how to deal with some of these issues that Professor uh, In has raised. Um, so maybe we can defer that a little bit. Your second question was about. Well, he so, he sort of answered that one. There must be a variety of traditions. Oh, regional, regional, regional traditions, and regional. how do you know which one now is the best for China as you go back to the countryside? And if regional, there is only one, or do you throw some aside and choose one or two that seem best? Well, Guizhou is, uh, I think you think it's the best place in China. <laughs> you know, these Guizhou merchants, though, they, they siphoned off a lot of wealth from other parts of China and brought it to Guizhou. <laughs> I actually have a question for the entire room because, I mean, it, this is relevant not just to China, but globally. Um, what villages, are there examples of a village, a agriculturally based village system that still works anywhere <laughs> in the world? I mean, we have this holdout in this little town in Belgium, and it's holding up the entire works, you know, of the European Union signing on with Canada for a free trade agreement. And this one little agricultural village that nobody's ever heard of, and all of a sudden they're in all the headlines. And so, you know, and, I, and I'm thinking of, about this village and thinking, you know, at the same, I'm thinking, yes, go, you know, at the same time that um, the, the, that globalization, the push of globalization is, is, it, is it inevitable? So I'm just wondering if anybody has comparative um, comments in terms of other parts of the world. Or, or you people have been to Xixi Nan, if you had comments on it. And go to the back and up to the front. So as um, Lee was talking about her experiences um, with the urban periphery sort of moving out uh, and um, you know the essential uses moving out and then there is building that kind of relationship, I was thinking of how some of that is reflected in Indian cities um, in the way uh, that, um, especially in the mega cities, the idea of the village is really sort of disappearing uh, rather quickly. And as the um, urban periphery is expanding more and more, uh, the idea of the agricultural village, um, the agriculture is disappearing, but the agricultural village is not. So that sort of gets subsumed within the urban. And so if I take the example of New Delhi, for example, um, they, there is a very interesting uh, urban phenomena going on there where um, the, the, um, they're called urban villages. Um, and so they retain that character. There is no urban uh, agricultural activity happening anymore. There is contestation with the municipal, the, the city's municipal agencies also for um, you know, all kinds of administrative aspects of governing that village that gets subsumed within the larger metropolitan area. And so there is a, there is a lot of loss of that agricultural identity taking place on the urban peripheries uh, of these rapidly expanding cities. And in fact, um, I would go so far as saying that the second tier cities, which are um, as the government of India describes them, between four and ten million, well, no, between one and ten million people, um, those are now following the same model. And some of the same things that I think Lee was talking about in terms of, you know, less walkability, um, very little agriculture, um, increasing dependence on highways and the vehicle. Uh, I think that's sort of very easily replicated in the Indian model as well. Um, and you know, and, and the idea of the agricultural landscape is really uh, one that's taken a hit. And if you go into the hinterland, um, the agricultural landscape has really suffered uh, economic setbacks, climatic setbacks, um, social setbacks. So all of those are taking place, 
in direct contrast to the quote-unquote development agenda of the country as a whole. So a lot of the things that, I mean, I missed a lot of the talks, uh, the, the in initial uh, talks, and I only was here for the later part of the second presentation, but um, it was very interesting and thought-provoking. So building on that, I actually had a question, if I may. Um, so, you know, th there is this idea of the landscape that I think a lot of you were talking about in this conversation. And I was curious, from a Chinese perspective, what is the idea of the land? Like, what is the landscape? How do you begin to describe it? Because when I think of it as an architect and a historic preservation planner, it's so many different layers of complexities um, in different contexts that we think of. Uh, you know, you can have. Um, uh, a physical landscape, you can have the natural landscape, you can have the agricultural landscape, you can have the intangible landscape, the cultural landscape, the archaeological landscape, you know, there are so many sort of interwoven landscapes that we think of in academia. And from a Chinese perspective, how do you sort of address or describe or def begin to parse out all of those different ideas of, of the landscape? I was, I was curious to understand that. Um, does anyone want to take that question? <laughs> I'll, I'll start. You can start. Um, actually, that was one of my first questions, which I didn't. I forgot to ask. <laughs> I could ask myself and try to respond. I mean, I'm not certainly not an expert in terms of uh, Chinese history. Um, but I can do an interpretation, um, you know, from what I understand. I mean, this, the, the bits of conversation in terms of, for instance, um, the defining of collective, uh, the redefinition of Confucianism, because uh, I grew up in a, a household, well, my father was anti-Confucius because he had those notions of Confucianism, which was based on the popular, um, Imagining it was very rigid, rigid system about filial piety, etc. But actually, through the Confucius Institute here, um, for instance, I've I've learned otherwise. So it's really opened up my view of it, and I would say that that probably has a big impact in terms of conceptions of landscape, because landscape is a conception. I mean, it's a contrivance. It's um, it's not land. So you, you mean we you, in, in English we use it freely, like we talk about the political landscape and um, economic landscape, cultural landscape. Um, so so as a contrivance, then it's very much linked to culture, which I think at this moment in 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 China in Chinese history, it's a very interesting, exciting moment because exactly it's it's at that crossroad, as I see it, in between um, tradition and, and then this big gap that opened up during the 35 years of Mao. And, um, and so a whole generation having, um, mom having limited access to those traditions, not having been raised, nurtured on it, and in the ways that previous generations had, so that disruptive effect, and then um, so so it's very, it, it's it's it, it's unpredictable in some ways in in terms of what direction it'll go in. But at the same time, um, I mean, I myself um, was not born in China, but um, the first time I went, I was 19 years old, so. I had conceptions of what I would find and then actually arriving. And this is way back. Um, so in 83 was the first time I was there when everyone was still, I mean, the landscape looked very different from what it is now, obviously. But um, I had preconceptions on what Chinese is. And then in terms of being faced with um, the, the, the hugely complicated uh, terrain that it is, um, Really, shook, really pull the rug from underneath my feet, but um, so so in terms of but but at the next time I went back, I regained my train of thought. The next time I get, went back was in two thousand and uh, two thousand and four, 
so huge gap in between. And I was um, stunned by how the traditions that I um, associate with old China had taken their place so quickly and so strongly, despite the intervening decades um, of denial. And so, I mean, you know, there were things like that I saw in 83, gender equity, et cetera, um, the class kind of struggle for class equity. And um, 20 some years later, um, those kind of hierarchies and delineations were suddenly in place again. So, um, but, but with the conscious, with the additional consciousness of uh, the possibilities in terms of the rest of the world and, and, and comparing oneself. So anyway, it's, um, that was a very convoluted <laughs> interpretation of what Chinese landscape is in my head. Anybody else? I think from a um, planner or architect's point of view, it would be similar to what you just mentioned. So it's the, I, my interpretation would be, uh, you know, a combination of buildings and the cultural change, uh, you know, things um, or changes that we have seen because of the urbanization's suburbanization, um, things like that. Do, do you have anything to add? Uh, I, w I wanted to try to get to more. I, I think uh, Professor Yu probably will talk more about landscape also, and you may, you may want to say something now, but we do have another comment or question. Yeah, um, I just wanted to, um, I was a student on the summer abroad trip to China, and I just, unfortunately, I can't, um, I need to leave, um, but I didn't see anyone else from that trip here or the other, the winter session one, so I just wanted to maybe provide a, a quick perspective from this, the students on that trip. Um, I think many of us were very, very humbled um, by, so Ch um, from, from our perspective, from what we saw, China's facing a lot of the same problems that can be found elsewhere in the world, um, where things like cars and modernization have disrupted um, ways of life and living, and, and especially from the planning perspective, how we live in places that are very spread out now because of these these modernization changes um, but coming from the Western world where especially in, in America which is such a young country um, that the, you know we keep mentioning this culture and that was something that was really humbling was to to go there and to, and to really realize that you know I think a lot of times when you're um, a designer especially as, a, as an aspiring designer to come from that um, another part of the world, another perspective, and you, and you think that taking a fresh look at things, you know, you're you're gonna come up with the answer um, or or have the, a great solution. And there was there was really a, a challenge to being able to to understand the perspective that goes back far longer than the perspective that we've been working with, and to how to to, to truly design good to make good designs of good work for, for that and, and to, to understand the, you know I guess we were just shown how little um, how much more there is to, to see and to know and, and how rich that culture is and, and um, I think one of, the, one of the biggest criticisms that we got at our reviews was that we didn't spend enough time critic or um, interviewing um, the, the people in Xixinan village and um, and what they thought of these changes because um, I think the comment that was made about the agricultural um, um, village, the, the social structures still being retained, I think that that was something that we saw because we could, you know, we were in this very, you know, we saw the, the most modern examples of Beijing and Shanghai and then we were also in these this rural community where you know you're you're you know you're eating what was picked from the field that day, but at the same time there's a, there was a high speed rail line that was getting put in through the village, and so to just look in, in one horizon and see this this thing the hundred feet tall um, 
bridge getting built and we would see it getting built over the, the, the weeks that we were there and then and then on the other side of the river there was a um, a, um, a like a set of hotels like a, a, a development getting built for for um, you know people on holiday so that was just just a really humbling perspective and you know I think um, you know if I am ever in a situation where I'm in, in another country in another culture you know I think um, paying attention to that that rich history is something that it should definitely be taken into consideration um, because you know there's we, we, we were shown a lot of examples where you know from from small changes to entire buildings where things just were plopped in like they, they didn't have the same place as so many and, and so much of the the design and the, the architecture that's been built it is all about the sense of place and where things belong in the landscape and and so that was just just a really humbling experience and I, I just wanted to, to maybe provide some I'm sure the there will be more students from the trips at the, the keynote lecture but I just wanted to provide some perspective with that now fortunately so. Um, maybe something. Oh, maybe something more specific. Jeez, <laughs> um, um, I don't know. I'm thinking of a lot because whenever I go somewhere, I'm, I'm not just thinking of my experience with that, but also what I've been learning or thinking when reading on at the time. So having gone, I participated in um, an exchange with Tsinghua University, which we had an exhibit here at UB um, last month. So that's when I first met Oning. Um, and we went with Millie. And so we were asked to collaborate with some of the students there, form relationships very, very quickly um, in a matter of two weeks and begin to work on something. And then they, um, in exchange, came here we um, finalized the project and put it on display. Um, I created a video. I had been working with video at some time, but I was working with a, a painter and a printmaker, someone who was interested in film and video, but had never um, thought it a part of his own practice before. And so we were thinking of images and just exploring and thought that something would come to be um, ultimately the final uh, story didn't even start in Beijing. It, it started here with his own story. And so I wanted to work with him and be the facilitator of that story. And it became one about movement and globalization in a particular way because of his experience, um, kind of a coincidental experience of him and his uh, boyhood friend growing up in the same uh, city of Zhengzhou. And then they ended up in Buffalo at different points in their lives. Um, coincidentally through UB, through the system. So kind of just that happens, you know, that it's a small world type of story. But I think that the strangeness about it is that that instantaneity, that the instantaneity of uh, movement in today's world. I've been reading a lot of Paul Virilio's theories on dermology, uh, the idea of speed and its um, it, it, in, a, in a changing perception of the world as a claustrophobic one that now we can fly, I can fly to Beijing tomorrow uh, very quickly. Um, and now my, my interest in hearing this discussion is one over maybe in this shift, we, we talk a lot about the shifts from you know, urban, uh, rural to urban and now maybe going back to rural um, or suburban and then this type of growing uh, middle space. But is this middle space all globalized, this middle space all the metropolis? Um, you know, wh where are these moments where it, it, is there some kind of space that cannot be overtaken by a particular model of growth? I'm also thinking of James C. Scott's studies on Zomia, which is or lands in Southeast Asia, which because of the geography, uh, allows people to live in the village in this type of, you know, it varies from place to place because it's such a large zone that covers Southeast Asia, but they all have commonalities, and that's mostly because the state can't access them very easily. Um, the infrastructure isn't there. Um, so in a way, they have this 
a level of autonomy that doesn't exist in other rural areas in the world. Um, and maybe there's such a situation that's happened in Chiapas um, with the Zapatistas there and because of the jungle and the density of that. So I'm thinking of landscape of, you know, we have the natural landscape, but also this, you know, all of these layers of landscape and they do come in conflict with one another. Um, so if there is this kind of rural, move back to the rural, can it escape some level of that in, uh, constant and ever demanding growth? And I know that was very long-winded too, sorry, but <laughs> those are my thoughts. Um, can I add something? Yeah. Well, I think a few comments are talking about how to, you know, kind of protect our cultural heritage. Um, the, the, the saddest thing to me is that um, in some areas in China, we got rid of the villages um, entirely. And then we build new buildings, but they are vacant. They're empty. Nobody's living there. So what are we doing? <laughs> Could I add to that also for this? Uh, thank you. This might, uh, my name is Julio, and I'm in uh, Millie's uh, installation class. But um, I had a question for you, Elizabeth, regarding your work. How do you, um, how would you like to see that um, uh, influence uh, a gathering like this? Um, or, or say it was open to, to, to people that were in power that could really make some decisions. Like the, the way you're, you're, you're learning to see things differently through your work. Like, like if, if you had um, uh, a wish <laughs> to somehow a painting can get it through somebody's thick skull that this is, this is a valuable way to see this. How can you use this to help in, 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 in making a decision? Or, or if you're addressing a collective of people, how can you use this, this uh, uh, just different kind of vision to make decisions that will, will change the landscape, basically, or preserve it, or, or come up with a compromise? That's my question. I feel like shouting back. Can you hear me? <laughs> Well, that's a very interesting question, and it reminds me of something B. Ron Rong said again, where you know modernism is denounced in in terms of it. It's denounced as a as a movement, as a destroyer of of the old traditions that we've been talking about. But and I'll just repeat it because I think I read some of it before. But um, hang on, gotta find it. Um, something that uh, oh yeah that the relationships between people, nature, and society are rich with the energy of communal production. So I think you can glean that I'm not a policy person, or, you know, I don't, I don't even, I mean, I have certain expressed political wishes like, you know, about the election and things like that, but I, I think that what, I think that what ink painting, even though it was a privileged form for the literati, who were then, who in the, in the instance of the Yuan dynasty fled the Mongol rule for the Yellow Mountains or er, similar areas to find freedom that was probably imposed by all the political situations that they had, that was imposed by those situations. But, you know, in those landscapes, like when, when all things fall away, I mean, this is, I know this is romantic, okay, but stay with me. Like, like, or or, or um, Nitsan, one of the great painters, such a simple mark, such spare, spare compositions. Somebody who gave away everything he had, who was enormously privileged and just ended up jettisoning this. Again, romantic. But I think that, that those landscapes offer a freedom, a, a free and easy wandering, quite literally, through space that I would hope that uh, 
as we're all co-creators of culture, that somehow that kind of freedom could be communicated. You know, it's very vague, but I really mean it. Like, that, that somehow that freedom, the freedom to see something differently visually that can correspond with some, a policymaker in a different way. It sounds so pie in the sky, but I think that that's how it works. Yeah, thanks. Uh, see two more, maybe we'll take these two comments and questions, and then, uh, do you want to start, and then oh. we'll... Okay, mine's pretty generic. Um, there was a documentary called The First Monday in May, and it was on the Mets China. Um, ex it was an exhibit of fashion and culture, and there was one part where um, they were having a debate and the debate was about whether um, too much emphasis was placed on history, on the old, the antiquated, and that the modern Chinese aesthetic was not being represented. And I remember one of the commentators said um, that there was no modern Chinese aesthetic, that that was something that was being forged. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that, um, you know, in a different milieu, obviously, in architecture and art, but. Um, do you see a current Chinese unified aesthetic coming out, or is this something that we're still uh, traveling towards bits and pieces? <laughs> I'll sing to you. No, um, I don't know. You know, in painting, there's been, or I mean, in in, in art, there's been movements from moving forward from the 80s and uh, kind of the social realism revisiting and then as the as China becomes more integrated in the 90s and now into global culture it seems like it's more of a free-for-all but there's certain things that maybe I'd look for that I, I notice I mean I'm thinking of actually the paintings of Yue Min Jun who paints these smiling like grimacing capitalist rotors just to not put too put, too fun to point on it. I mean, they're just these grimacing characters <clears throat> in, a, in a socially realistic depiction. They're kind of awful in great paintings at the, at the same time. Kind of awful, really, but anyway, he's, um, and, and, and so there's that kind of overt critique that picks up on the social realism of before and sort of turns it against itself. But honestly, based on my knowledge, which is some but not thorough about Chinese painting I, or Chinese art um, because there's so much else um, and especially video and things like that that a kind of touch I suppose a kind of sense of lavishness that just feels different because it is like forbidden city colors or I'm thinking of this artist in Shanghai um, and I can't remember his name right now but he does these really elaborate performances with video backgrounds where there's people who are painted in face paint and like like people like dwarfs who work out a lot he puts them all in these films and then he does these really elaborate like scary performances you know he's naked he falls to the ground I mean it's just it's so over the top you're in a state of shock and um, I'll find his name for you, um, but I can't, I can't think of it now. And and despite all that, there's a kind of orchestration of space and uh, a tone to it that, while can be very crude, is also elegant. I mean, so it's, I think it's a matter of touch in a way. Uh, there was a, a show called... Uh, uh, well, it was called The Wall, but it was on maximalism, um, curated by Gao Ming Lu uh, here for, it was in the UBR Gallery and the Albright Knox um, 2000, and maybe 10 years ago, six, 10 years ago. And he, he was the curator of the first so-called avant-garde show in Chinese history in Beijing, which got shut down very quickly um, due to some per performances. Uh, and, but, um, this, the idea, I think the idea of maximalism, perhaps, and, and just segueing from what you were saying, Elizabeth, in terms of um, the, there's a certain kind of excess, but it's restrained excess, materiality, and, and, and you know, I mean, the, but the work ranges from um, the, the, the intentionally ugly to the very exquisitely meticulous to 
very gutsy kind of visceral performances. So aesthetically, you, you know, I mean, uh, I don't know. You know, you, I suppose you could ask the same question of any culture now. Um, what is an American aesthetic? I mean, I certainly couldn't tell you in one sentence. Uh, so, so, but, but I think that that kind of exuberance exuberant expression, even when it's restrained, so so-called maximalism, to me that's probably closest. This guy, I, I, I want to say his name is Chen Tianzo, but I think I'm wrong, but he shows with the Bank Gallery in Shanghai. So if you Google Bank Gallery and look at their roster, you'll find him. We have time for one more question or comment, Bonnie Foyt Albert, and then we'll take a little break and we'll come back for the keynote. So I hope you'll stay for that. Thank you. I would love to make a comment. Um, I think China has had some of the most beautiful history, and we call it buildings matching nature. But I did a book with Nan Chun Chun, Walter Nan. It's a sort of American name is Walter. And this book shows you how, through China's many dynasties, one of the most beautiful aspects, I think, of China history is how they used natural sites, celebrated them, and created progressions through each of these sites. So if you look at this book, China's Sacred Sites, it's really all about the various natural sites in China, how they've been used, used in a very favorable, celebratory way. Some of the sites, East Lake, it's extraordinary. It celebrates the five senses of humanity. There is uh, the Leishan Buddha, which is a 230 foot tall <coughs> carving on the cliff of the Buddha. There are extraordinary sites in China that fortunately during the Mount Tsing era, they were not destroyed. And that's what this book is celebrating, these various sites that are more remote. Not all are well known, some are. But I think that um, if China can go back and celebrate the kind of natural aspect of their environment that you've got so much, and if you go to these sites and you see how they were used, you actually have models for continuing that kind of respect for the planet, which we don't see a lot anymore with modernization. Um, as you said, there's a lot of pollution. I've seen it. When the Olympic Games were in China, they shut down the factories so that the pollution would not uh, be available and then, of course, after the Olympic Games were over, and then, of course, the factories came back into use. So I would urge you to take a look at this book, any, any students that are here, because you'll see sites I haven't seen any place else, and I do a lot of traveling. I also like Burma a lot, Bagan, and those, those sites. But I, I do think, in a way, respecting the past and bringing some of the philosophy forward in terms of respecting the nature of your country or that country is very, very important. You'll see sites you wouldn't see any place. Does a grotto? Oh my God, it's gorgeous. And it is a grotto. You're by a river, and it's got um, carvings, cave sites, and so on. So um, I would. I would hope that in the future we begin to kind of revitalize that respect for nature that we had. And feng shui, as you know, was a big, big thing. North, south, east, west, dragon, church. <laughs> anyway. So we uh, come to the end of our session. Uh, Bonnie Boyd Albert and her book are here. If you'd like to take a look at them. Also, the students' exhibition is out in the, in the hallway. I hope you'll take a look at that and uh, reconvene at 6 o'clock for our keynote lecture by uh, Professor Yu. Thank you very much, and thank you to the panelists.